So I've been uh, in ISCOLS 20 years, and I've talked to a lot of the old timers about when it started, and it started somewhere from 19 to 22 years ago. So we need somebody to write a history of the society because nobody knows really how old it is, but this might be its 20th birthday. I'm happy to be here. I haven't been able to make it the last few years, so it's really wonderful to be here with you uh, again in this post. It's uh, one of my favorite organizations of all in the academic domain. So I'm going to talk about three things today. Uh, societal conditions matter beyond income. This is what Carol Graham was mentioning this morning. Happiness is not just personality. If you've been in this field a long time, you know we went through a period where happiness was pretty much equated with the way you lived your life, your personality, your mental outlook, and so forth. And in fact, Norman Bradburn, one of the people who was really early in the field in the 60s, he got out of it. He was really doing excellent work because he didn't think happiness was policy related. He thought it was personality. Uh, so sad to lose him, but I'm going to show you data to show that if anything, societal conditions are more happy, more important than personality. It's just extremely important to our individual happiness. Subjective well-being, high subjective well-being, what that causes. And this is really what we've been hammering on for 10 years. So this is probably one place where I might divert from what Carol said this morning. She's not sure that we should push happiness as a policy imperative, but rather use it to judge quality of life. But what I'm saying is that the data now are so strong that happiness is a good thing and has influence, beneficial influences on health, social relationships, citizenship, that maybe we should push it. And in fact, happiness is not so much hedonistic as it is a virtue in itself. This, it's out, she said, the horse is out of the gate, and I'll tell you how far out of the gate where we've come with that. So societal circumstances matter, and I think the people in this room would probably agree with that. It's not just personality, and it's not just economic development, although that can be important, especially if I'm getting people out of the poverty level. So here are two countries in the world from the Gallup World Poll, the country with the highest life satisfaction in the world and the country with the lowest, Togo and Denmark. And as you can see, this does not happen much in the behavioral sciences or social sciences, not overlapping distributions. 97% or 94% of Danes are above 97% of Togolese in life satisfaction on the Cantrell lab. It's just amazing, right? Conditions don't matter. It's all personality. If you just think that the Togolese got more of bad genes and happy genes, of course not. This is the condition of life in these two uh, societies. Now, is it beyond money? Well, here are two countries, uh, a couple of you did a few years back, uh, household income and uh, Costa Rica and South Korea. And as you can see, Costa Rica was one, had one-fourth the household income as South Korea. And yet, Costa Rica's in, uh, life satisfaction is very much higher. and. 67% of South Koreans said, I feel positive most of yesterday, I enjoyed most of yesterday, whereas 88% of Costa Ricans did. A huge difference in these, despite when people say, well, I don't believe the numbers. Some, some economists still say, I don't, I don't believe all those self-reports, life satisfaction. I say, well, believe this. The suicide rate in South Korea is the highest in the OECD, and for women, it's like super high over even the second country. So as, as you can see, I entered GDP per capita, and then I entered three other things. And as you can see, counting, being able to count on others in an emergency, having somebody you can count on, came in a little stronger than GDP. And corrupt, of course, corruption comes in in all of our analysis as a negative. But then life expectancy enters, so it's not just GDP gives better health, but better health seems to predict beyond just GDP. Countries that are able to uh, you know, have a life expectancy that goes beyond their GDP, that adds to the life satisfaction of countries. So there's a lot going on here besides money, and we'll, and we'll come back to what some of those things are shortly. So the, the question then is, 
do we want to measure it, and is it a good thing to measure? Because if it's simply hedonism, that is, it's simply people enjoying themselves, and they could get it from drugs or sex or alcohol or going to the you know uh, betting parlor just as well. Why would a society want to track it or, or try to increase it? And so this is you know is happiness a good thing? To be stupid, selfish, and have good health are three requirements for happiness. Though if stupidity is lacking, all is lost. So <laughs> Gustave Flaubert obviously did not think happiness was a good thing, and other people follow suit. Are you annoyingly happy? Despondence could be right for you. <laughs> kind of bring your moods down a little bit. Dear mom and dad, thanks for the happy childhood. You've destroyed any chance I had of becoming a writer. So the idea that you have to be unhappy and tortured and really be creative and so forth. What we find in our reviews of the literature and our own research, and I now put this evidence as clear and compelling, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt that it includes longitudinal, experimental, cross-sectional data that happiness, subjective well-being, and life satisfaction increase health and longevity. They better social relationships. They increase work performance. They increase citizenship, like helping others. And they increase resilience, that is, how long it takes you to bounce back from negative events. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, live longer. And so when you compare the none, and I take credit for this study, I didn't do it, but I accepted it as the editor of the journal. So it's one of my favorite studies. And the thing about it is the nuns all live in the same circumstances. So there's a lot of SES type stuff control. They're all eating the same food, living in the same places, uh, hopefully, you know, not too many bad habits. And here, between the ha happy and unhappy nuns, they have a few. Uh, uh, my cousin, who's a nun, is visiting my wife right now, and she told me about one bad habit related to whiskey, but I won't mention it. Uh, so in the nun study, what most people don't realize is that this difference was not trivial. The happiest versus least happy quartile of the nuns, there was a 10-year difference in life expectancy. <coughs> Oops. So then you say, well, nuns, you know, they're different. That's a weird group. How can you generalize? So we take a less weird group, psychologists. And here we had a five-year difference. So the, these are all psychologists, famous psychologists who've written autobiographies. Sarah Preston scored their autobiographies for how much positive affect was in them and how much social relations was in them. Uh, Floyd down there on the lower left with a cane and a cigar. And she found that people who mentioned positive emotions in their autobiographies lived five years longer. People who mentioned their family and friends lived five years longer. Uh, then she looked at mine. So I wasn't part of the original study. These are all, uh, obviously, people who have already died. Uh, so she could get longevity. And she ran mine through the computer. And she said, Ed, Ed, 75 psychologists, great news for you. Yours was the happiest autobiography of all 75. And I said, that's wonderful. I'm probably going to live a long time. But I have to tell you, I had read your study before I wrote my autobiography. So data from uh, Steptoe and Wardle. Uh, this takes start people at 50, divide them into three groups, high positive affect, medium, and low positive affect. Look at their survival rate by months. You can see over a five-year period, they're, they're spreading from the very beginning, the survival rate, right? And we see this over and over in longitudinal data. You control for time one variables, and you get differences in how long people live. This hasn't just been done with nuns and psychologists. It's been very done now with very large, very heterogeneous samples. Why do people live longer? Because they have stronger immune systems. You bring people into the lab. You can put them in a good mood in some way, and you'll find that their immune si uh, reactions are stronger. You can bring them in and sequester them in a hotel for a few weeks, expose them to the flu or cold virus, put it up their nose. Then you can count their boogers if they get you know, sort of a cold or not. You can also inject under their skin a virus and see how strong their immune 
rea uh, uh, reaction is to it. And what happens is that people who come into the lab in a more positive mood or into the hotel in a more positive mood have a stronger immune reaction, less inflammation, less cardiovascular disease. The data for cancer are very mixed. It's not clear if uh, happiness has any uh, immune power against cancer or helps you get over it or more or not. That's controversial. But cardiovascular disease, I would say, the data are very strong. Things like heart attacks and, and strokes and so forth. And better health behaviors. What does that mean? That means that happy people are more likely to exercise. Uh, unhappy people are less likely to exercise, more likely to smoke, drink too much, unhealthy diet, less seatbelt use. Very clear differences. The happiest people, don't, not every one of them wears their seatbelt, but most do. And as you go down in the happiness ranking, you get less, less and less of these kind of health behaviors. So the data are just very clear. Here is one of the most intriguing, wound healing. So psychologists, biologists can make a little wound on your skin. In other words, cut out a little tiny snippet of your skin and then watch and see how long it heals. When you do that, people who are higher in trade positive affect heal more quickly. But also it's been done experimentally where they have a couple come in and they argue with, they get them to argue with each other. Or they come in and talk about something that's very easy to do. Yes, yeah, it's it's exactly. you know, uh, 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 cooperate with each other. You then see wound healing differences between the two groups. Though. And also, if you treat people for depression or, or, or other maladies, you will see that various health markers, cytokines, and so forth increase. So the evidence is pretty darn strong here. Um, we have these data that we just were analyzing, hot, not off the press, they're not published yet, where we looked at state level happiness, and, uh, and, and we also did it on the internet and found the same thing where you code words on the internet. And people's scores on depression and happiness by state, it correlates, you know, just as you'd expect with heart disease, uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, deaths, and physical activity. You see all the kind of correlations you would expect, not just at the individual level, but at the state level. So how big is this effect? People say, OK, what is it compared to smoking? What is it compared to eating your vegetables? And I don't know, because this is kind of a random selection of studies, and I haven't done a systematic meta-analysis of the studies, but I can just give you my impression is it's not quite as important as quitting smoking, but it's a lot more important than eating your vegetables, right? Now, if you're a smoker and it makes you happy, I think you'll still come out in the negative end because the smoking effects could be, you know, 14 years or something. But you see these effects, 10 years, 7 years, 5 years, 4 to 10, depending on what subgroup, uh, depression, and a comorbid mental illness, meaning you have schizophrenia and mental illness or whatever, huge negative effects. So the effects here are not trivial of happiness on health and longevity. The social outcome, friends, we used to think, oh, Having friends makes you happy. We now know that being happy also gives you more friends. Being a happier person gives you better marriage, less likely to divorce. Of course, there's no guarantees here. And there are studies now to show marital couples, the happier marital couples, not surprising, they have sex more often, right? So in a lot of ways, it helps your social life. So. We like people more. You see, I've been trying to play around with uh, photoshopping. So I did Mona Lisa and Happy Lisa. Because there's a study that said that as people come in and they either interact with a depressed person or a happy person, they go out and do another thing. And then they said, OK, in the next study, you can have somebody new or you can have somebody different. But once they had the happy person, they want to talk to them again. And if they had the depressed person, in round one, they say, oh, no, I'll choose somebody else. It's not surprising, right? People avoid unhappy people, at least in American society. And they're drawn to happier people more. Uh, 53 years ago, uh, when we met, and she was 16, and this is her picture in the album. Uh, so we were juniors in high school. And I thought, wow, she's cute. She's smart. So I fell in love with her. 
But I might have fallen in love with her for the wrong reason, because I should have been looking at that smile. Because that smile is what's found in these studies to predict getting married, staying married, and not getting divorced, right? At least for women, this is predictive. That the happier, because men don't, they like to look like tough, tough guys, so they don't smile much in photos. But women don't have that norm, and you've seen this not replicate once, but replicate three other times where you find this effect. And so the, the, the women who are happier in self-reports that we find in our states, we found this across a bunch of societies, and you can control for all kinds of things like SES and personality, are more likely in future years to get married and stay married. Right? So it's not just smiling that predicts it, but it's also self-reports of, of life satisfaction. So here are some data, and Rich Lucas have worked on these kind of data for a while, where we've got the uh, German socioeconomic panel over time, and you can see here's two groups. We're following them from five years before they get married at year zero to five years after uh, that event, and it's either the divorce event or getting married. And as you can see, from, uh, from, from five years before, the people who are going to get married and stay married were happier individuals, having nothing to do with their marriage, right? They didn't even know who they were going to marry at that point. And the people who are later going to get divorced are, on average, less happy from the beginning five years before. Now, obviously, in all these cases, it's no guarantee. I mean, there's a lot of exceptions like anything else. But probabilistically, it's there. Yeah. All right. We found in, two, I think it was 2002, that your cheerfulness entering college at age 19 predicts how much money you make 20 years later at age 39. And it was a strong effect, the least happy to most happy. The most happy made 30% more income, controlling for parental income, college uh, major and, and occupation, right? Very strong effects. And uh, psychology, you may or may not know, is having a replication crisis now because a lot of our results aren't replicating. So I'm happy to say that even Oswald replicated this, and uh, this finding has been replicated now in four countries, that happier individuals controlling other things later earn higher incomes. And here you'll see it's true in uh, Deneve and Oswald's study, both for positive affect at age 16 and 18, and for life satisfaction at 22 years. Pretty robust finding. And again, substantial differences. In four matters, so it's not just helping the individual. The places where workers are satisfied with their job, engaged with their job. So this is a Gallup study. Two, over 2,000 work units, over 140,000 individual employees. And over on the, on the right, you'll see financial performance of the institution at time two. And over on the left, you see positive work attitudes, like uh, job satisfaction, work engagement, and so forth. And you see that, 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 that positive attitudes toward work predict later financial performance and a lot of that effect goes through employee retention, there's less turnover, and also through customer loyalty. Okay, and as you would expect, when people go to a business and people are happy and they like their job, the customers like that place better and keep coming back. And as you would expect, people who like their job don't quit and, and uh, go to work in a new place as much. And that all helps the financial performance. If you look at it the other way around, there is some causality in the other direction. Financial performance will influence work attitudes, but it's a weaker effect. A very impressive study done by uh, who was at Wharton at the time, now at LSE, London School of Economics. He found that places with satisfied workers, their stock goes up more over time. And why is this important? Because stockholders, when they buy stock, they know everything that's public about a company. They know all about debt and what new products they have coming out, right? All of this stuff's supposed to be public. And so stocks are pretty well priced, but yet one thing they probably don't know is how satisfied the workers are in a particular company. Those numbers aren't published. And so it's interesting then that that factor can influence stock prices over time and they go up more over time. 
Here is what I've come up with in reviewing the literature. All the reasons that happy workers may be better workers in places with happy employees may be better organizations with greater productivity and profitability. Lower health care costs, not surprisingly, people are healthier. Less turnover. And each one of these can be modified by characteristics of the economy and so forth. If there's huge unemployment, then you don't get much turnover. It doesn't matter if people love their job or hate their job, right? You don't get turnover. So each one of these, uh, uh, fewer sick days, but of course if people were paid hourly, then that isn't as influenced, etc. So each one of these is subject to modifiers, but each one of them in general comes out. Greater customer satisfaction, more organizational citizenship, what does that mean? That means that happy workers are more likely to uh, help other workers on the job, not steal from the job, enhance creativity. A lot of both experimental and cross-sectional and longitudinal research shows that creativity is enhanced by being in a good mood. Perhaps a tiny bit of negative mood mixed in is good, but a lot of good mood is really good for creativity, uh, safety, more energy, and greater social skills. All these reasons, then, the happy play workplace is the better workplace. You know, I really don't care if my workers are happy. This is before we had all these data. I want them to work hard. They can be happy on their own time. They can monkey around and have fun on their own time. They're here to work. That's why they call it work, right? It's because it's work. And we don't care if they're happy or not. Well, the tough old boss better be changing his or her mind now because of the data to suggest that that this is not going to work. And the more complicated the job, the more freedom there is in the job, the more high level the job, the more these factors are going to come in. Perhaps on a, an assembly line, you can control people enough that it doesn't matter as much. But you get people like professors and you get uh, you know higher level managers and so forth who say, who do you want to work for you? Get Ed Diener. Why? Because he absolutely loves his work. My gosh, he's going to work on the weekend. He's going to work at night. He's been working all the time. He loves it so much. So I, I, I think the mindset of the bosses is changing and it's going to change more. We have all these things that uh, happiness or subjective well-being, including life satisfaction, positive affect, or negative affect, help help uh, people, they benefit people. Health and longevity, supportive relationships, work performance, helping others. There's a lot of stuff on, on helping others. When people are in a good mood, they're more likely to be altruistic, more likely to give money to charity. Resilience, I'm not showing you the data, but in the Gallup World Poll, there's people who have everything bad happen to them. They've been assaulted, they've gone hungry, they don't have a, a money for a house, just terrible lives. If they have other people they can count on, they have purpose in life, uh, they are so much more resilient to these bad things happening and suffer much less because of the resilience provided by the background positive affect in their life. I'm not saying you need to be happy every second of every day. You're not saying you have to be intensely happy. I'm happy most of the time. I'm almost never ecstatic or euphoric. I'm just pretty happy most of the time, 95% of the time, and only I'm happy a little bit. And that's fine. We find that that uh, uh, level of happiness is just right. If you have really intense happiness, it sometimes can get you in trouble, uh, media. It can also lead even to some health problems. And having no negative affect is also not what we're talking about. Right? We're saying you ought to be negative. You ought to be sad at your mother's funeral. There are times when it's appropriate. So we're not saying get rid of all negative affect. But chronic negative affect, that's the one that's bad for you. So I said to the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, I had a couple of these, what they call dialogues with the Dalai Lama. And I said, is there any? Time, happiness is bad. He said, oh yeah, there's stupid happiness. And I said, what's stupid happiness? And he said, well, if a bear is chasing you and you're happy, that's stupid. Right? You want to be afraid at that point. It'll make you run faster. So that's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, sometimes you do want negative affects. We're not saying to get rid of it. And we're also not saying that you need to be a 10 in satisfaction. Some of our data show that the 8s maybe make more money than the 10s. Uh, but the, the tens are real happy with their social relationships. They have great so they're very social people. 
What I'm saying is making a stronger case that we should have accounts of well-being because not only does it reflect the quality of life of society, but it's a good in itself. And I think most of you know this quote, so I'm not going to read the whole thing from Robert Kennedy. It's famous in our field. The GDP, I'll start in the middle, does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our school uh, officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to the country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. I think GDP and that are, contrary to the speaker this morning, important, valuable, but that, that doesn't measure everything, and, and, and happiness measures some of the other part of that. So I'm going to give you a little history on national accounts of well-being for policy purposes. And what we're talking about here is collecting good circumstances alone, but because it in a way is virtuous. Citizens value happiness. We find that college students rate it higher than any other value in the U.S., China, they don't rate it as highly, but they rate it very highly, just not the highest of all values. All over the world, people rate happiness as a very strong value. And then, of course, what this group has always pushed is we're going to measure subjective well-being because it reflects quality of life, not just beyond GDP. So here's a little history. We go way back, and uh, Europe was doing life satisfaction measures. Jeez, uh, going back in the 70s. I started in 2003, I talked to the World Bank, and they thought it was kind of crazy, it didn't make any sense to them. Uh, so they were still kind of skeptical, but they weren't hostile to the thing. 2005 to 2007, at the University of Pennsylvania, we had a program where we brought people in, and we brought in policymakers, philosophers, sociologists, psychologists, and we brought in people like Alan Kruger, who was Obama's chief economic advisor later. Uh, and I think these meetings really started to turn around some of the economists. Uh, in 2008, I talked at the UNDP in, uh, in New York, and they too were skeptical. Uh, a lot of economists and demographers there wondering about whether these measures were valid. And of course, the Gallup World Poll measured life satisfaction across that estimation. Then 2010, a huge thing happened. Prime Minister Institute the measures, take care of Grand Toby about each one uh, for policy purposes, and, and they had the four I's of citizens' well being in the measures. Then uh, 2013, uh, European module uh, 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 went all over the uh, European Union countries and tracked subjective well being, very substantial tracking. 2014, 41 nations. our lab that we found to predict these differences in subjective well-being in societies. As Carol said, economic development, you don't want to be starving, you want to get above that, you know, 30,000 a year household income, whatever, so you have enough food, shelter, etc. Economic development, I mean, it comes out very strong in the Gallup World Poll, I mean, we're talking about correlations of 0.8. Progressive income tax, so Shigeo Ishii and I find holding tax rate overall tax constant, and controlling for the income of the country, having more progressive tax predicts the happiness of the country. We don't know if it's causal, it could be the other way. So if they tax rich people at a progressively higher rate, it's not a flat tax, you see higher life satisfaction in those countries. Human rights are protected, Peter Diener and Diener. We've got five psychologists in our family, so there's a lot of people to publish. And uh, we 
we found that you know if you don't disappear in the night, you have you know a right to report to trial and all those things that happiness is higher. Low inequality, Shige and Oishi and I found this too, that as inequality has increased in America, happiness has declined, and, and this is true probably around the world. In the world data, we're starting to see that uh, income equality, inequality is growing almost everywhere, not quite everywhere. Brazil's actually improving, which works for us, but it's improving. China becoming very unequal. And uh, you know, there's a lot of explanations for that. But what we find is that income redistribution things, like in America, the earned income tax credit, buffers that. So in earned income inequality is not so bad when you have some redistribution efforts by the government. And then finally, as I mentioned before, low corruption. We and other people have found it quite a few times. OK, here's some other things, uh, not from our lab. And uh, clean air, you know, clean uh, downwind from a smokestack is not good for life satisfaction. Green space, a lot of data now. The more greenery around in the city around you, uh, the higher people's life satisfaction. Active commuting, you bike or walk to work rather than take the subway or a car. There's job programs. Uh, Dick Easterlin has shown are related to higher well-being income security programs. A lot of data on that from the Notre Dame uh, political scientist Radcliffe, caregiver programs, etc. So we know a lot of things that are related to happiness. And so these are policy relevant. And so we say to the, the policymakers, gee, we want equality, welfare benefits, progressive taxation. They say, are you crazy? This is a democratic agenda. So I say, no, because there's some Republican things in here, too. It's not all democratic, liberal stuff. The, the, red, the red states down there, they, they like low corruption. They like efficient government, not just government spending, but it has to be efficient. They like low crime and high income. So these are all things that Republicans could favor. And the reason this is important is it's just a liberal thing. We're never going to get it in. We're never going to get it to, to be put to use because one side or the other is going to fight it and not want it. So it does support, to some degree, both sides in, in, in the liberal conservative spectrum. All right, checking well-being reflects specific aspects of quality of life. We've seen it. And those aspects can be relevant to policy these national accounts can help policy debates. They're not the only thing. Other things like the environment and just worrying about the environment separately from our happiness are going to matter and money's going to matter, but this thing matters as well. It benefits, benefits people in terms of health, relationship, citizenship, and productivity, and therefore it's worth tracking. And it can give valuable information to policy makers. Made progress on the implementation, can get, we get policymakers to use these numbers? I'm not sure. This is the next big task. I think it's up to researchers and others to get them to do it. But I can tell you probably two cases in the UK uh, where it has happened to some degree, where the life satisfaction measures have influenced policymakers. And one of those is in extended mental health care giving it to a broad, putting more money in there and offering mental health for mental illness to a broader number of the population, largely due to Richard Laird and the House of Lords pushing this, showing that mental illness, of all the illnesses, produces the most misery in society, both to the family and to the, the person themselves. And another place that's probably been used is in allocating uh, health research 